we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, can everyone hear? Yeah. Everyone here, all good on Zoom and everything. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming to this rescheduled class. Um, yeah, glad everyone is okay from all that weather a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, since this class is a little later, um, you know, we have some of our stuff coming up a little bit sooner than um, if we had had it two weeks ago. So um, your fall plant orders, Rachel sent that out. Um, we need them due, they're due this Friday. Um, so that'll be plants and seeds. Um, if you have any questions, email us, but uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, our fall plant distribution will be next Wednesday, August 30th from four to six. We will send out a sign up for that, um, for what time you can come, but it'll take place at Rain Crow Farm, which is Rachel's farm. Um, and that's going to be exciting. Um, they also grow plants for us this fall. So, uh, we're super thankful for that. Um, and we will need volunteers, um, starting at 1 PM, um, on Wednesday and that'll be, um, helping divide plants as well as a couple people to help us with the distribution itself. Um, we'll be handing out fall plants, fall seeds, as well as cover crop seed. So everybody will get a uniform amount of cover crop seed. Um, and then, you know, you have the option to, well, Lexi will talk about this, but we'll, you have the option to plant fall plants or plant some cover crop or some of both or whatever. So, um, and then for the last point, um, our last canning class will be next Monday. Um, so we'll be sending out the registration stuff for that tomorrow. Um, it'll be pressure canning and it'll, I, I'm pretty sure it's at the Farm Bureau, can't quite remember, but yeah, it'll, it'll, we'll state that. Um, so if you're interested in, in pressure canning, then I would highly recommend you sign up for those. We, this is our last class. So, um, you know, I think we've offered a lot of really cool classes, but yeah, if you haven't come and you're like, really want to make it, you should come. Um, and then also, um, harvest totals be due in the next couple weeks. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then our next workshop will be the second Monday of September because the first Monday is Labor Day. So, um, make sure to put that on your calendar. It'll be September 11th. It'll be here, um, 6 to 7 30, but second Monday, don't come on Labor Day. Yeah, and then um, Lexi's gonna take over and um, talk about fall gardening and soil health. So uh, we'll let her do that. So tonight I said fall gardening, soil health. Um, why garden in the fall? I know a lot of folks think that the season really just goes from about May to September and done for the year, but it's quite possible in East Tennessee to grow year-round, hopefully to coming out of your garden year-round, um, with very minimal investments in season extension equipment, which some of which we'll be handing out next um, workshop or at the next handout if they don't coincide. Why we want to garden in the fall? It's not as hot. Um, there's fewer pests and diseases. You're not going to get bitten by hopefully as many mosquitoes in the winter. And the weeds don't grow as much. So I think all around it is a much more pleasant experience than when it's 90 degrees in the middle of July. So just some things you don't have to finish up or you don't have to quit on the summer stuff. You don't want to just yet. Um, in August, you still have time to plant a few really quick growing summer crops. So you can get another round of bush beans in edamame, uh, which is soybeans, uh, summer squash, zucchini, um, possibly cucumbers. You just want to check your seed packets and see how much time it takes for the plants to grow. Um, I'll go over that in the, in the next slide, but peas are good for now. Brassica, so anything in this family, broccoli, Brussels, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kale, anything in this family is good to plant right now. Root, some root vegetables, um, and you want to make sure you're picking varieties that are for fall growing. Uh, beets, carrots, radishes, turnips will all do pretty well in the fall. Um, the onion family, you can get green onions and beets in over the winter. And then cool season greens, 
Um, this is kind of a catch-all category. Um, the whole category of Asian greens usually do pretty well over the winter. Um, chard, lettuce, mustard, spinach, etc. If it was green and leafy, you could probably grow it in the fall. What are the Asian greens? Hot soy, bok choy. Um, gosh, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, I don't even know. But um, if you like that, then you can grow them. <laughs> Um, in terms of stuff that you can harvest in August, if you haven't gotten your onions and potatoes out of your garden, they're probably getting close to being ready. Um, both of these, the onions will kind of fall over and start to dry out when they're ready to harvest. If they're taking too long, you can also go in there and bend them yourself um, and let them dry out for a few days and then you can pull them out. Potatoes will tell you when they're ready to harvest by dying. Um, you can pretty much dig up a potato anytime if you want potatoes for dinner. You can go in there with a shovel and get them out. Uh, if you want to store them, I would recommend letting them die back completely and then waiting another one or two weeks for the skin to really kind of solidify on them. And then you can dig them up and they should store pretty well for the, for the fall and winter. Shorter season winter squash. So this includes acorn squash, delicata, spaghetti. That should be, you know, getting getting good this, this month um, into September, if, not, if you haven't already. So this can be a little tricky, but for the most part, they will get darker as they ripen. So they become kind of a uniform shade or they get darker, just depends on the variety. Some of them um, are not a uniform color. They should, should feel firm. The skin should feel firm. They should feel pretty he you know, heavy when you hold them. And then you're gonna wanna look for this nice moon where the squash rests on the ground. So it's usually a different color. Like on, it's kind of that classic acorn squash. It's a dark green, but it's got that kind of orangey moon on the bottom of it. And that's usually a good sign that it's ready. Melons, um, cantaloupe are really easy because they usually just will slip off the vine when you're ready. So you don't want to like put too much pressure on it. But if that, if you push it a little bit and the vine pops off, that kind of looks ready. If it doesn't, don't force it. It still needs a little while. Watermelons are a little more tricky, sort of. Fun art the stars have to align i think sometimes we pick watermelons um some good signs are the dead curl next to the fruit um so the vine that most of the watermelon should have a little curl on the vine next to them when that turns brown shriveled it looks pretty dead it's a good sign you also want a dark colored moon where it rests on the ground um some people like to bump their melons that's probably a whole art in and of itself um so if you pick a bad watermelon your first try, you've got a few more on there, you know, Google it, try to see what, what the internet says about getting good watermelons, um, but they can be a little tricky. <laughs> uh, what to wait for, things that generally are not ready this time and you wanna wait until September to harvest them are your win the long season winter squash, like the butternuts and the pumpkins. Um, you'll see this kind of, this is a butternut, you'll see the kind of spottiness on it. Um, and it's still green and it's starting to turn um, a little tan orangey here. These, and a lot of pumpkins are the same kind of like spotting color too. So when they get a kind of uniform solid color, whatever their final color is, that's a good sign that they are ready. The skin should be, um, you shouldn't be able to nick the skin with your fingernails. So you can indent the, the skin with your fingernail and it's probably not right yet. Um, I have several, I, this is my first year growing butternut. I have several that are the nice tan color but the stems are still green. That should be okay. Um, if it's truly a solid tan color yeah. and the skin is hard and it's not gonna dent easily, then they may be ready for the okay. Yeah, okay. some varieties are faster than others. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. But you really want that uniform color because that's when the sweetness develops. If you pick it too early, it's not gonna be too sweet. So you could try one and see. Actually, they've been tan for a couple of weeks. Okay, they, they may be ready. Yours may be ready. Okay, yeah. Uh, Sweet potatoes, you want to hold off on these. Um, they're technically a perennial, so they'll keep, they would theoretically keep growing, except the frost kills them. Uh, you don't want them to get frosted, that will damage the tubers, but you do want to let them keep growing. Um, so you can pick them late or dig them up late September, or uh, just any time before there's a frost warning, you want to get them out of the ground. Uh, but the longer they're in there, the more they'll grow. So there's no reason to dig them up early. Uh, popcorn, if you're growing that, you really want them to be dry on the stalks. So usually late September, early October, when they're nice and crispy and dried out. I don't know, it would be fine, it's like really small. 
It can be. Okay. Did you um, grow the robust that we gave out? I did, and I figured it probably just didn't grow. And yeah. I, I, I pulled ones to see what it looked like. They just all seem pretty small. Um, the husk is small. Okay. But I won't pick any more until. Yeah, give it give it a rest, and it could just be something in your soil. Mine are huge, like they're really tall. Yeah, but the, it just seems really. Skinny. Yeah, the, yeah, it's they they're thin. Skinny. They're much thinner. Oh, um, that's okay. Yeah, they're gonna be a much smaller cob. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. So the cob, sorry. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, the husk is what's gonna dry out. Okay, so you want to leave it there. Yeah, okay. leave it. Yeah. Um, until it's just very dry. Okay. Yeah. Third question. You, I'm saying you can wait until uh, right before the first frost. I tend to dig them up late September, early October, but you definitely have to get them out of the ground um, before the first frost. Yeah, the frost will not be good things for that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, new pest. <laughs> oh, These things are terrible. terrible. This is a pickle worm. And they fly up from Florida. I this started probably three, four years ago. I started seeing them here in East Tennessee. They will lay their eggs on the summer squash, summer and winter squash plants. Um, they will initially go for the flowers, and I have pictures on the next slide showing this. So they'll they'll burrow into the flowers. Uh, they will eat the inside of the flower, and once they get a little bigger, they'll start burrowing into fruit. Um, so they can really kind of ruin a crop. So you don't want to let things hang out. Uh, once they're ready to pick, and you want to keep a monitor for the for the holes so you can get things out. Um, if you catch them early in a summer squash, you can just cut out the you know the parts where they're in there and eat it. If it's in a winter squash, before the winter squash finishes ripening, you know it may ruin the crop. So you kind of just want to keep an eye on them. Um, some very hard rind squash may be somewhat resistant, but I've I've seen different things. Sometimes they'll take out a bunch of crop, and sometimes they won't. So Kind of depends, but you can see the hole in the flower. You can see the hole is in the squash where they're burrowing in. This is what the moth looks like. I think they fly at night, so you may not see them around. Uh, they are, it's a moth, it is a caterpillar. It's technically susceptible to, to BT and spinosad if you want to keep a regular spray schedule on your crops. Um, I would stick with the BT if you if you want to go buy that um, because you are going to be spraying around the flowers and uh, spinosa can kill bees. Um, and you just want to if you can catch them when they're in the flowers, you can just take the flowers off and get them out of the garden. Um, once they're in the squash, they're in the squash. You're not going to be able to spray to get them out. So just kind of keep an eye on them. Uh, know they're coming. August is tends to be when they hit, so you probably have to start monitoring at this point. And uh, try to minimize damage. You can, um, you know, you could because I think they. I'm pretty sure they fly at night. You feel you want to confirm this on the internet, but you could cover things up with with insect netting at night and then uncover it during the day. The problem is is that squash is insect pollinated, so you can't keep the covers on full time. Otherwise, you won't get it, or you'll have to go in there and hand pollinate things. Um, which if you really want to, you can email me and I'll tell you how to do that. <laughs> um, some other August gardening tasks. I would really, if you haven't yet, remove your brassicas um, from the garden, the stuff you planted in the spring, just get them out for a week or two. We'll get in the fall brassicas. Just give time for all the pests that I'm sure are eating everything to get let them fly off um, and so that you'll give your fall brassicas a better chance of survival. If you had, um, Blackberries, raspberries, any kind of cane fruit, you can prune off the um, parts, the stalks that produced this year. Don't prune off the new growth, but prune off this year's growth. Um, that anything that fruited, get those out. Um, and then you can plan out your fall garden and where you're gonna plant cover crops, which I will talk a lot more about very soon. So with fall gardening, there's a few things you need to think about. There's the timing of the first frost, which is often at the end of October, early November. Um, you're contending with cooler temperatures, uh, especially at night right now, uh, decreasing daylight hours, which impacts plant growth. You'll want to think about variety selection, uh, cover cropping, and then put it where you're going to put your season extension infrastructure, which is in this case, low tunnels. 
So first for us again, October 15th through November, November 15th. So this means that we have approximately 55 to 85 days till we get our first frost. So again, as I was saying, you can put in some summer crops if you want. So like zucchini often has a 50 or 55 day window um, for it produces. So you could probably get another quick round of summer squash in if you're really feeling it. Um, so just make sure you check the seed packet uh, and you know if that's what you want, want, want another round of beans and stuff, go for it. Cooler temps, again, uh, this is a great time for leafy greens, brassicas, peas, alliums, all this stuff that was in in the spring. Um, could go back in again. It is still pretty hot right now, although it will be getting cooler, so keep things well watered, just so, because it is cool season, the heat's gonna start them out. Um, just keep them watered. You wanna look for varieties that say fall, winter growing, as we're going into these cooler temperatures and lower light situation. Uh, I will say cold hardy crops often get pretty sweet after it freezes because sugar is the plant's anti food basically. So they will increase sugar production. You know, that's why um, kale and collards and stuff taste a little sweeter in the winter. So I actually think they taste, um, they're, they're better to grow this time of year anyway. Um, oh, I meant to get this up because apparently this site no longer exists, which is very sad. Um, so I did mean to remove that, but you can Google varieties, um, you know, just put frost hardy varieties. And I'm sure they come to this somewhere. No, you don't have to rotate them necessarily. Um, I usually just, as long as you didn't have any kind of disease situation going on, um, and specifically something called um, black knot or a uh, black root or something like that. Um, Basically, as long as you didn't have some sort of catastrophic plate failure in in the spring with your brassicas, there's no issue with you planting them there. Okay, and that can help with with rotation because if you're doing a rotation within the same year, that's gonna make it harder to rotate things in future years. So I keep them in the same spot uh, and don't worry about it unless there was some sort of issue. Day length. Um, so plants need at least ten hours of sunlight in order to grow. So when there is less than 10 hours of sunlight, they will go dormant basically and stop growing. So we hit that below 10 hours from December 10th to around January 15th. So plant growth will stop. So if you want something to be harvested during that period, it needs to reach maturity by early December. So that's really your cutoff point. So there's a lot of stuff like lettuce, spinach that are pretty fast growing. It's very cold hardy. So you can get that in kind of in late September, your last kind of planting of that, if that's what you want. So it's mature by early December, it will hang out at its mature size. You can harvest it and eat it when you want it. Did you have a question? Um, and then once we hit January 15th again, we cross up back over that 10 hour threshold, things will start wait, break dorm, start to break dormancy slowly, uh, start slowly to regrow. And then by the time we get to March, we usually, a lot of these overwinter stuff are going to go to flower, probably become a little bitter. You want to take them out and start something in the spring. So making room for fall crops. So, but sorry, that's the wrong date. August 30th is when we are picking up plants. And uh, so a lot of summer crops like tomatoes, peppers, they're going to grow up until they die during frost, okay? But once it's frosted, it's going to be too late to replant something uh, in that spot. So you kind of have to think about, you can make choices about what you want to keep now and what you want to put in now uh, so that you will have something to eat if you want in November. So just kind of think about what do you want to be eating in November? And those are the things that need to go in the ground in the next month or two. Um, however, if you want to keep those, to, you know, keep some of them, all the tomatoes, that's just a decision that you, you know, want to make at this point in time about what you want to stay. And then you can, you know, just draw a quick little map about where things are going to go and go for it. Okay. Curing storage crops. So as you're harvesting all this stuff, um, I mean, there's a whole list of things that you can grow during the summer that you, if you cure and store it properly, you can be eating this during the winter. It's a pretty nice long list of stuff um, that you can be, you know, if you didn't grow enough of this this year, you could be thinking about it for next year about what you want to store. Um, so there's a whole, there's four basic, uh, storage conditions for crops. There is a, a cold, dry, a cold, moist, a cool, dry, and a cool, moist. 
situation. And these all desire different things. I'm not going to talk about it, but if you want Johnny's seeds has a really awesome um, article about storage crops and how to store them in the right conditions and how you can try to get some of these conditions going on in your basement, most likely. Um, if you have a root cellar, awesome, even better. There's some cool stuff, you know, some cool, that's probably the most ideal condition uh, for storage, uh, but not everyone has that. So this has some ideas for how to kind of recreate these things or where to put them for optimal storage. I will say with storage crops, don't try to keep them. I mean, eat them, you know, don't don't sit on them until January, February and think that, you know, they're all going to be great. You're going to start losing stuff. So just, you want to be eating it as, as you go through it. Um, so seed saving, just really quickly, this is a huge topic um, we could spend hours on and we are not going to, but I do get this question a lot this time of year. So, um, you know, open pollinated versus hybrids. So open pollinated are the ones that you can save seed from. Hybrid, you can't because they don't breed true. Now, open pollinated means that the genetics have been stabilized so that the seeds will look like the parents. Hybrids are just a mishmash of all kinds of different genetics. And so those seeds will, will not look anything like the parent for the most part. We do give out a lot of hybrid plants in this program. So if you're not sure, just ask if you wanna try saving seeds um, and we can tell you what's what. Uh, but I don't know where I was going with that. I think that's, <laughs> there's variety isolation needs. So some things, you know, just need 10 or 20 feet of isolation from another variety um, to prevent cross pollination. Some things need like five miles. So you're never gonna create that situation. So you often have to work with um, hand pollination and bagging the flowers, something so that you're preventing the wind or the insects from pollinating it so you can control what, what pollen gets in there. Uh, I was gonna say about the hybrids. We give out a lot of hybrids because they're often very disease resistant and we want you to su succeed at gardening. So there's no there's no judgment or, you know, some people only want open pollinated because they think there's some sort of moral high ground here, but uh, you know, there's there's benefits to both. You just can't see and save on the hybrids. For example, like our, the tomatoes that we gave out, you know, I think all of them are hybrid except for the Cherokee purple, which is very low, so. Yeah. As they, are they susceptible to disease. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to try seed saving, there's three things here to, you know, the beans and peas, um, very easy. You basically just let them dry on a plant until they're nice and crispy and the beans are hard. Um, and then you want to shell them. And I, you really need to freeze them after shelling because there's some little insects that often has laid its eggs on the beans. And so they will burrow in there and just, they will eat your bag of beans, but if you can freeze them, it'll kill them. You don't have to store it in the freezer, but the freezer is actually a great place to store saved seeds. So it's fine to just leave it in there once you do it, but definitely shell them and freeze them. Tomatoes, um, and again, these are pretty easy because they don't really need to be isolated all that much. You do, um, it is nice to have 20 feet in between varieties. Um, honestly, most years you can probably get away without it. Um, it's just some years you might accidentally get some frost. So if you're really intent on keeping a, a, a variety pure, uh, then you will need to have at least the 20 foot, foot isolation in between varieties. So with tomatoes, when they're ripe, you just scoop out the pulp and put it and seeds and put it in a jar. You gotta let it ferment for two or three days. Then you gotta wash it, um, spread it out to dry. You can usually just leave it on like a paper plate or a paper towel or something. Let them dry pretty thoroughly and then you can store it in a freezer. Um, and those are probably the easiest ones to try. And if you are super into it, you can, there's all kinds of websites on seed saving, like Seed Savers Exchange. Yep. I have an unusual squash um, yeah. that I like to save seed for. One of those two methods works well for. So squash insect pollinated. So they're, and they hybridize very easily. So there's a very good chance that it's been that the seeds have been hybridized. And so it's not gonna be true. Um, and squash is one of the ones where you have to go out the night before, you have to bag the flower okay. so that once it opens, so, well, it's probably, I don't know, maybe too late this year. It, it, it's a fast maturing and I, I have some little, little tiny okay. flowers. So you have to hit the female flowers before they open, all right? 
Um, and then you put a bag over it the night before. Once it's open, you got to get the male flower that you want yeah. and hand pollinate it. Yeah. And, um, and then bag it again so that nothing else gets in there. Um, and then, mark, you know, mark that so you don't lose it. And, um, and it's got to, is it a summer squash or a? Oh, it's, it's trombosino. So it, it can be used as a summer or as a winter. Okay, so I I, I, I don't know. There may be time for that to truly mature. It, you don't, you can't pick that one green. It's got a, it's got to turn, um, it probably is, it's related to butternut, so it's going to turn tan. Eventually, yeah. Yeah, so it's got to fully ripe. Yeah. And then that's when you can harvest this. So, and I don't know, I mean, you can try and right. see if there's time. If we have a really late frost, then you, it may mature in time. Yeah, and it, and I mean, it, it was planned as three to four weeks ago, so. Okay. And it's up, it's like 60, 65 days. For green eating. For green. Yeah. Okay. And then everybody's back yeah. Back. So we'll see. Uh, okay. <clears throat> All right, any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. So the leaves have just completely taken over. Yeah. Um, I have no energy to go out there and take a little bit of whacker. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering for the fall, I'm not going to do the whole garden. Yeah. It's just do two front beds. Um, do I just go out there and weed whack it? Like, pull yeah, out what's you, in there? Yeah. You don't want those weeds to go to seed. So anything you can do to prevent the seeds, even if that means mowing it, okay. that, that's fine. Um, yeah. Probably. Probably the absolute best thing you could do is just to mow it and tarp it. Um, and then put in cover crops in three or four weeks. Okay. In that spot that I'm covering. That yeah. I'm covering the tarp. Yeah. Okay. Smother everything, kill it, put in cover crops. If you're truly just done, then just leave it tarped. Okay. Yeah. I want to do just some spinach and yeah. kale. Yeah. So just cover it for a few weeks and then yeah. plant. Yeah. Okay. You could. And then just for the rest of the garden, just mow it, cover it with tarp yeah. for the next year. Tarp it. Yeah, okay. Don't let those weeds get out of control. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it'll be exponentially worse next year. Yeah. If they go to see. Okay. All right. Oh, another question. Uh, we sent the, I, I think they're, they're at uh, Waters at Labs. Uh, no, sorry, we haven't gotten the top, the, sorry, we haven't gotten the uh, raised bed ones because they had to go to a different lab. Okay. I'm sorry, we're going to try to do that tomorrow um, and get them out to, because those have to go to UT. That's a different, different thing. So they should, Shauna, they should be back in the yeah. next few weeks. They're usually pretty quick about it, yeah. so we'll, we'll keep you posted. Sorry. Um, they just don't go to the same place as the other ones. All right. Soil health. So fall is a great time to think about soil health. If you're really interested in no-till gardening, now is a great time. Uh, it's a good time to add compost and mulch to some cover crops. So we're going to talk about um, soil health principles, um, which has sort of been rebranded as regenerative agriculture. Um, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so people may ask, word. why do I bother? Uh, and I will say that healthy soil grows healthy plants and will have less pest and disease issues. You'll have bigger, you know, more vibrant growth, um, more diversity in your garden. You'll have better yields, fewer problems. Uh, we have pretty problematic, we have difficult soil. I'm just going to put that out there. You know, if you're new to East Tennessee, you're probably horrified by the what, what you, you know, is in your garden right now. But, uh, and it can take a good three to five years to get really kind of um, nice, friable soil. So keep at it and it will eventually get better. Although I will say that starting with clay soil, it's it's once you get uh, the soil organic matter up in your soil, you, you, um, it will last there longer. The impacts will last longer than you would if you had sand to your soils where it all just kind of washes out right here. So there is some benefit to the clay, even though it's kind of difficult. So. In your soil, there's this whole like circle of life going on um, beneath the ground. Everything, you know, and it all is based off of or soil organic matter. So this is kind of the, the food supply to this entire system is based off of this, um, plus what the plants are actually exuding into the ground. 
And so everything, you know, starting from bacteria, fungi, nematodes, going all the way up to these kind of larger animals and birds. Um, so a lot of folks in the soil health wor world refer to this as your underground herd, uh, because in really healthy soils, you have about two cows worth of life in your soils per acre. So you want to think about how you are managing you know, all the critters that are below ground because they are still providing a lot of tangible benefits to your garden. So tilling causes a lot of problems. It can lead to soil degradation, erosion. It can cause hard pan right below where the tiller tines hit. Um, it'll cause compaction down there, which can make water, um, uh, it makes hard water hard, uh, makes it difficult for water to move through the soil. Compaction, <clears throat> nutrient runoff, it causes nitrogen to leave the soil faster. It can increase feed pressure, increases soil pathogens. So that the bad bacteria and fungi get a little water. <laughs> um, so now when you're starting a new garden, especially in East Tennessee, often it's hard to do anything but till to get it going and you may have to till next year. But, um, you know, the goal is to get to a no-till or low-till situation. So, you know, soil health improves the soil microbes, so you have less pathogens in your soil. Um, nutrients become more available to your plants. They're, they're able to uptake, you know, if you're, if you're spending money on fertilizer, but your soil health and your soil pH is off, then your plants aren't actually getting access to it. Um, and also a lot of times if, if soil health is poor and you're applying fertilizer, which costs money and it just washes away, um, uh, there's nothing to hold on to it in the soil. Uh, and then also that the soil health also makes uh, your garden able to withstand both large rain events and periods of no rain. Uh, so in those situations, soil organic matter, uh, will help your garden withstand all of that. So uh can you go completely no-till uh i prefer to focus really on low-till and minimizing tillage uh than possible so if you hear about no-till on you know farms that are five ten thousand acres and they're doing it through roundup basically um, by killing that so it can be hard on an organic in an organic situation uh to kill off the cover crops it takes a lot more planting um, and because instead of spraying Roundup, you have to use tarps. It's going to take about three weeks to kill your cover crops. So you kind of have to get the timing right when you're using them. Uh, so it does rely on a lot of black plastic tarps, that kind of situation. Um, there are ways to use recycled materials, uh, cardboard, that kind of thing. But you're going to need a lot of material for the spring. Um, so start thinking about that now. And then considering uh, you know, that you are managing an underground herd and all the life that is living in your soil. So there are basically five principles to soil health. Um, you want to minimize soil disturbance, so that's low till, no till. You want to maximize, you know, coverage on your soil. So this is, you know, making sure that there's stuff growing all the time, or you're using mulches. Um, there's increasing biodiversity, so that's really just um, increasing the the amount of plant diversity will increase the soil diversity, um, and then continuously having live plants in your garden either through growing crops or through cover crops. And then the fifth one, which was recently added, is integrating livestock. Um, I think on a garden scale, if you don't have chickens or, or anything, uh, to me that often means adding um, you know, manure and compost into your garden. So kind of getting those benefits without having to keep a goat in the backyard. <laughs> uh, so first principle, keeping the soil covered. Uh, Ray Archuleta is a really big name in the in the regenerative ag soil health world, and he says, you know, this is a slide from one of his presentations where he says, "This soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever." Um, it's not a good situation for any kind of life that's trying to survive in that soil. So, um, keeping soil covered means using mulches, using cover crops, and all of this has the benefit of reducing weeds. It retains. Uh, water moisture keeps the soil much cooler. You know, if the sun is 90 degrees, you've got covered soil, your soil is not going to be baking. Um, and then it and also, all of this mulch, all of the cover crops, all that is feeding your underground herd. That's the kind of food that your underground herd needs to so survive and multiply. Next slide. So reducing soil disturbances. Uh, 
you know, this is reducing tilling and then creating these permanent planting walking areas, which I harp on a lot in the spring. And that's so that you aren't stepping on where you're growing things and creating compactions. You're reducing compaction um, by not stepping on your beds all at all. Next one. Uh, keeping plants growing year round. This is a graphic, it's a little blurry, but you can kind of see the root tip and then it is actually exuding sugars into the soil and there are all kinds of microbes that are eating those sugars. And those microbes um, are often, uh, you know, taking nutrients up from the soil and feeding that back into the plant. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. So it's not that the plant roots are not actually drawing up nutrients from the soil. It is this, it's the bacteria and the fungi in the soil that are taking those nutrients out and exchanging them for sugars from the plant. So um, it's actually kind of a fascinating little world down there. Um, and so the this whole, a lot of, you know, besides just mulch and stuff that's coming in um, from the top of the soil, these roots are really the food source, you know, for, for all of these little critters. So no live roots means all of that soil life starts to die off. So growing crops, keeping live roots in the soil has a lot more benefits, although it can be hard on a smaller scale. So mulch kind of gets you most of the way there because it is introducing the soil again. Um, but it's not got that kind of um, rich food source that the sugars are directly into the ground. So anytime you aren't growing something, it's great to have cover crops ready to go. Uh, and there's plenty, especially in the summer, there's some fast growing cover crops like buckwheat um, that can kind of fill in a four to six week gap, you know, when you're filling roots up or if you need it. And buckwheat's also great for plants too. So growing a diversity of plants. Um, so I mentioned companion planting and intercropping in the spring. Um, you can do that with your food crops. You can also do it by putting in a cover crop mix that's got like four or five different things in it and kind of increasing that diversity. Because each plant is exuding different sugars, different nutrients to the soil. So the more diversity of plants you've got, the more diversity of root, you know, uh, exude extra dates. Um, the more diversity of soil life you're going to be creating. So crop rotation helps with that. Companion planting cover crop mixes can all help with the diversity. So incorporating animals manure, you can run, you know, ducks and chickens or whatever through your garden at the end of the year, um, or you can be using manure. Uh, again, with manure, you just want to be careful about um, if the animals have eaten anything that's been sprayed with those persistent herbicides. So you, if you do going to get manure, that you think is safe, um, just test it out a little bit because you don't want to put a contaminated manure in your crops on your garden. Um, and then if you have a larger farm homestead situation and you can run livestock through during the winter, um, that's one way to to kind of you know or put put rotate where your where your garden is um, so that it's alternating between like pasture and garden. Um, can kind of get that kind of diversity and the, and the plant or the ant, uh, larger livestock going through the garden. There's whole books on that if you're curious if you're in that kind of situation. Um, cover cropping. So we are giving out cover crops. Are we giving them out next week? <laughs> Sweet. So cover crops are great because they prevent erosion over the winter. So there's something growing. Those, those uh, roots are locking up the nutrients in your soil. Um, rather than if it's just bare soil, a lot of those nutrients are going to get washed off. Um, and so you're going to have a poor soil come spring if you don't have something covering it. It increases soil organic matter. Um, it increases soil life and diversity. It stabilizes and increases nutrients. Uh, so there's a lot of legumes that are also uh, often in cover crop mixes. And so those are actually fixing nitrogen into your soil. They're increasing the amount of fertilization in your soil. And it suppresses weeds because um, they just are shading the ground out through the through winter and spring. Um, so weeds don't have the ability to germinate through this kind of thick mass of cover crops. So <clears throat> I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You are going to share the PowerPoint. So if you're really curious, you know, there's basically four types of, of, of things that can go into a cover crop mix. You've got grasses, which usually make up the bulk of your mix, probably you know, 60, 70, 80% of your mix is going to be grasses, um, legumes, again, clovers, um, Austrian winter pea. So hairy vetch 
is often one that you'll see in commercial mixes. Um, I would avoid using that. It just, it has a tendency to like escape and become a weed um, in your garden situation. So, did the light just keep down? Okay. <laughs> um, so I would not, I would not personally ever plant hairy vetch in a garden. Um, so I would stick with clovers, Austrian winter pea. Um, and then you definitely want, um, some people will use white clover in a cover crop situation. I, that's a perennial, so I would avoid that, but we give out crimson in ours. I think that's one of the better ones. And also if it flowers in the spring, it has a pretty flower. That's, that's a good insect attractor. Brassicas, um, daikon radish, um, sometimes it's referred to as a tillage radish, but they'll actually produce a root that's two or three feet long. So basically, it will just punch through compaction in your soil. So sometimes if you have a lot of compaction in an area, you can just sow straight daikon radish, um, let it kind of punch through. And then um, ideally, you want it to winter kill. So it, if it gets below like 15 degrees, that radish dies. And that's just a tube of, of organic matter that starts rotting in your garden. Now with the radish, it can get pretty stinky. So just be aware. If you have, you know, in the mix, it's like less than 5% of the seed mix is, is daikon radish in our mix. So you're going to get a few of them. Um, if you're really trying to work with them to reduce compaction, just know that it'll get a little stinky. Um, so is it, the daikon that they're it is edible, but again, you don't want to eat your cover crops because they are for the soil. So um you want them to die during the winter, or you want to smother them in the spring so they start kind of rotting into the soil. But yes, if you really wanted, you could dig up a couple of your dead comrades and eat them. It is totally edible. Um, a lot of these are edible, but you're not using them for that. The radishes get huge, they do. <laughs> um, also, other brassicas, mustard, rapeseed, collard, and turnips. Some people use them um, to, uh, especially the mustard. I think produces a lot of uh, potent, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what the word is, but it's, you know what mustard tastes like, it's pretty spicy, right? right? That actually um, can help kill nematodes. It, it's so powerful. So some people use the very bad nematode problem, which hopefully not on wood. We don't here in East Tennessee yet have nematodes for the most part. Um, if you have family down in Florida, don't bring that back up with you. Bring nematodes. Um, yeah, you can you can let animals forage on cover crop. Just don't let them like totally destroy it. But yeah, that's that's a that's a very popular method of incorporating animals is to put cover crop down. Um, and then I mean, Google it. There's all kinds of info on which cover crops would be great for animals. Um, and then non-legume raw leaves is <laughs> kind of the last catch-all. It's not not any of the other things. Um, buckwheat's a great. Summer one, it's my kind of preferred one. And then there's folks that will mix in all kinds of other stuff for various purposes um, for, for cover crops. And the mix we're giving out this year is um, rye, daikon radish, crimson clover, and Austrian winter pea. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I will, actually, I will say it's kind of cool that um, with grasses, rye and sorghum are allelopathic, nice big word, um, which means they contain chemicals that can prevent weeds from germinating, other plants from germinating. So it's good, it's nice to have, a, um, have them in your cover crop mix, especially um, over fall and winter. So into the spring, you've got a nice healthy patch of rye, you go to smother it. And so that will actually have a, a weed germination um, prevention for about three weeks after they die. So it can help you get kind of a jump start. Um, because on on spring, so you don't want to put seeds into that get them germinate, but you can plant already, you know, your your starts, your plant starts into it, and that will kind of give you a jump start. Um, they're you know, they fix legumes fix nitrogen, so they're great to have in a in a mix. Um, there's all kinds of things. This will be sent out to you. Uh, brassicas again, the daikon radish. I mean, you can see how deep this root is going. It's pretty massive. Um, you don't want to use too much of them now, unless you're trying to use too much of them. But. And then non-leggy broadleaves, like I said, buckwheat is kind of my all-around favorite for the summer. And yeah, anything that flowers is great um, to attract pollinators. 
you know, during the summer and then um, you'll smother it and, and get that soil again. So that's what we're doing. Um, September is the ideal time to plant cover crops, but um, you can wait. So rye will generate, will germinate through December. Rye will pretty much just grow whenever you plant it. It's the other stuff that's not going to germinate if you plant it too late. So you, it's kind of a balance um, between, you know, some stuff is going to produce longer and you want, you want that food coming out of your garden versus the kind of soil health benefits. So really trying to think, you know, can you put at least part of your garden in cover crops, you know, September, early October, um, to really kind of give it that the benefit of, of especially the legumes and the daikon radish to be able to grow to a sufficient size before the winter hits. Um, so it's just, you know, think about it. I'm again, sorry, the date's off because we were originally going to do the 29th. forgot to update all of the dates. Could we plant more sunflowers now? Um, yeah, just check the, the, the date. They're really more of a summer, more of a summer crop. Um, so it just depends on how long it takes them to grow. You see any flowers from the time. When you're adding compost to areas that are perennial like strawberries, what do you do? You just scatter it around on the plants or what? Yeah. Yeah. You do that. Or um you can do compost, you could also just um do like a, a mulch of like straw or shredded leaves uh, around the plants that, that'll have um you know, and then fertilize directly in the spring. So you, um, you know, you kind of get some of the same benefits. And mulch will help prevent weeds, you know, from coming in too. I would also say that, like, going back to the cover cropping, like, if you're going to be planting um, fall plants that are going to maybe overwinter, you can, like, alternate your bed. So, like, you know, maybe half of your garden goes into cover crop in September, so you get those full benefits, and then the other half you plant fall plants and then the next year you do a different, you know, the switch them. So yeah. you have that like balance. Totally. Um if you are so cover crops need to be smothered by a tarp um, or something thick, something opaque. Um six mil black plastic is great. Um again you have to think about timing. Uh, you want to smother things about three weeks before you want to plant into them. Um, just give it enough time to die. Uh, the longer cover crops grow, the more benefits, soil health benefits you get. So again, it's balanced. You know, if you can leave some of it until your summer crops in May, you don't want the cover crop to go to seed because then you're going to be dealing with it's going to become kind of a weedy situation. Um, so, you know, by late April, you want to tarp your cover crops so that you'll be ready to plant in May. Um, but if you're doing spring crops, you know, it's okay to smother it when it's smaller. Um, just because you want to get your crops in. So just you gotta think about timing wise for that. And that's just a picture of the tarp on the cover crops. Again, planting into the cover crops, um, you know, you can transplant directly in. Um, if it's large seed like squash beans, corn, so this was probably uh, direct seeded into the cover crop residue. Um, for small seeds, you know, you either need to, uh, you know, do plant starts indoors, or if you really want to directly sow them, you're going to need to scrape, you know, the top of the cover crop off so you have a, a, a seed place. You, uh, or you just have the soil, the bare soil to see. Uh, but then you don't really get the uh, benefits of the, you know, the weed suppression that this is going to give you to get rid of the natural soil. So trade-offs. Um, so that's basically it for tonight. Uh, next session, again, September 11th, um, we're going to talk about season extension, some more building low tunnels. Uh, we'll be talking about planting garlic. We ordered that. We don't know when it's going to come in. This was a surprise. <laughs> yeah. So probably late September, early October, we'll announce we've got garlic. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about harvesting and curing sweet potatoes and then kind of late fall garden chores. Where did we get the landscape fabric? We ordered it from Deerfield. Did we? Oh, the Amazon. Amazon. Wait, landscape Amazon. fabric or the? No, the, the. Sorry, the row cover. Landscape we fabric yeah. we got from Amazon. Um, the row cover that we'll be handing out in September, we get from Deerfield sorry, in Kentucky. So, yeah. We found the cheapest price for landscape fabric was on Amazon. Yeah.
It was about a hundred bucks for a three hundred foot rail. Yeah, it was like Dewitt, three point two ounce, I think, yeah. four feet wide. Yeah, you can email us. Yeah, two second years get cover crop. Yeah, yes. Other question? Can you go back one slide? Um, Landing in the number of the um carps are super expensive. Um, so if I want to get around that, um, I can plant the cover crop and then what mow it down before it goes to seed. Yeah, and then just let it sit there until the spring. It will likely it, it. it will likely come back. So the tarp cuts the sunlight off, gotcha. basically, and that's what you're that's what kills it. If you mow it, you may just invigorate it. Okay. And you then can buy a roll of plastic. You can buy some expensive things. Yeah. The yeah. six mil black plastic comes in pretty good rolls. Oh, okay. From like Lowe's or Home Depot. Okay. Yeah. And it's reusable and like take care of it. Okay. And other gardeners might be willing to go in on a roll to throw that out there. Tough for, yeah. What about um like a lot of straw? Um, yeah, I mean if you put down like good you know, eight inches, eight, ten inches of straw. Yeah, it probably won't smother it. Um, on, on, you can also look up um, <clears throat> how to crimp it on yeah. a home scale. So that's on a large scale, a lot of times they are um, using a really, really heavy roller crimper yeah. to, but it's, you don't, but it's not cutting it, it's crimping it. Right. And so you can see if there's some homemade things you can do to okay. crimp it. Um, but it's hard on a small scale to kind of get the weight. I mean, I have like round, very rounded mounds. But I don't know. I'm thinking of crimping as like a flat object, right? And you kind of move it across and it, and it flattens. Yeah. I'll, sometimes people will make like boards on strings and you kind of just like yeah. model for your garden. But again, you need like the heaviest person you know because it's that weight factor that's hard yeah. to achieve on a small scale. Um, and so, so the cover crop, because there's a difference between cutting and crimping, and just and, and also a difference between crimping and just laying it flat. Because if it's just laid flat, it'll spring back up and keep growing. But crimping kind of kills it in a way that that I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure the science, but it kills it and keeps it from coming back. <laughs> Whereas like cutting it and just laying it over don't kill it, right? Um, you can Google it. I would do it. Yeah. Super curious <laughs> about any of that. But I, honestly, if you if you are doing the tarp, then you can mow it, um, and then just tarp it because that the sunlight will kill. Um, you could also use something like cardboard and like put something on top of it to kind of weigh it down so it doesn't blow away. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's a little cheaper option. Yeah, than um, tarps. Just three weeks of no sunlight. Yeah, could be just if we're not gonna play. In that area, should we just keep it covered? Keep it covered for it and for the tarp, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, ideally, you would tarp it, and then once you get a lot of, if you get like fall leaves, you know, or a lot of grass clippings or compost or whatever, you can just pile it under, you know, take the tarp off, pile it on, on, on it on the ground, and then tarp it back and just kind of let that stuff rot over the winter. Um, that is pretty good. It's not as like great for the soil as cover cropping, but it's pretty good. So just kind of like composting in place, basically, or sheet mulching, any of that stuff. You know, you can do over the winter. If I got compost already, yeah, I don't need to do that again. Um, for this year, no. Next I would year, I would. Yeah, yeah, next year, um, you can apply more compost. Um, but yeah, for the winter, really, something that's going to rot down. I don't know if I have to come for $400. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> it's okay to alternate here. Okay. But you want to do something else to kind of help the soil health as well. Yeah. So, you know, if you can just start dumping all the like grass clippings yeah. and uh -huh. shred leaves and stuff into that garden area, okay. that's going to have benefits too. Okay. You're yeah. building organic matter that way. Yeah. And honestly, that's what I do. Yeah. For the so, most part. If you have Bermuda grass, you can use grass clippings, or is that a bad idea? As long as it's not got seed heads in it, it should just be grass. I, mm -hmm. and, and as long as you're not getting root, root, the roots in there. 
But yeah, if it's got seed heads, um, so don't don't wait too long. Yeah. Um, also, does anyone want perlite? Like that? Okay, I've bought some perlite. I don't really want to take it back with us. If anyone on the online, it's for hydroponic. What were you? It doesn't have to be. You can mix soil or anything. Okay. Uh, anyone would like well, we bad with perlite. I don't know. No, uh, it says specifically way. not for food good stuff. Maybe it's because it looks like popcorn. I was like, is somebody eating perlite? <laughs> like, why do they need a warning? Um, yeah, I mean, okay. Do you have any ones for perlite? All right. Okay. Cool. Uh, you got to come to the office. Yeah, you got to come. come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Email. Do you think of anything else? <sighs> 